Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and that is Courtney. Hello. So every week before we get started, we make a few announcements. So we just wanted to remind you that there's a few things in our description and show notes. We've got links to... Finding the right pros for home projects can be tough and spark a lot of questions like, how do I find a pro who can help? Will they do a good job? Will I get a fair price? That's where HomeAdvisor can help. From leaky faucets to major remodels, HomeAdvisor connects you to the right pro for the job in seconds and even helps you get a fair price. Read reviews, check project cost guides, and book appointments. Go to HomeAdvisor.com or download the free HomeAdvisor app to start your next project. Our social media, if you want to follow us over there. We've also got links to our resources that we use for every week when we study a case. So if you want to read a little bit more, then check those out in the show notes. And we also have links to our Patreon and our Threadless. So if you want bigger merch items like t-shirts and phone cases and all sorts of stuff, check out our Threadless. And if you want smaller items like magnets and stickers and some bonus episodes, then join our Patreon. So I forgot to make a list of new Patreon people, but we're, we'll do it next week. But in the meantime, I did want to say we do have a new Patreon episode out. We do. So we discussed a current news case and put an episode on Patreon. And if you listened last week, you know that I accidentally erased a track, but hopefully this week we will have another Patreon bonus, as long as we have time to record. We'll get it done. Or should I say re-record, record it again. Re-record. So um, yeah, I think that's it. New Patreon and another one coming. So keep an eye out for those and join our Patreon if you want to hear those episodes. And I think that's it. We can kind of get started on our case for this week. Sounds good to me. So we are still on letter E for elderly murders. So we are talking about some murders that actually commit their crimes later on in life. And in the first elderly case that we discussed, we also went through why this is kind of an anomaly or how criminal behavior changes. So if you want more information about that, you can go back to the first episode. But we have another case of Melissa Ann Shepard today. So we know Melissa as Melissa Ann Shepard, but she had a bunch of different names, like Melissa Ann Russell Shepard Stewart, Frederick Weeks, a bunch of stuff. She had something like six different names or something like that. So... She was known as the Internet Black Widow, and most commonly people say Melissa Ann Shepard. She was born on May 16th, 1935 in Burnt Church, Canada. A lot of people called her Millie, so Millie, as she was sometimes known, moved around with her aunt to Ontario in 1953, and she completed high school at Stafford College through evening classes. Sounds relatively normal. Especially, I mean, I feel like Canada is one of the only places where you have really extremely positive stereotypes. Oh, completely. (laughs) So it does sound relatively normal, right? Yeah, like she's starting off, you know, with a foundation. The only thing that kind of seems like a red flag is the fact that she moved with her aunt. So there's something about her parents not being involved that would make me think she couldn't kind of form normal loving attachments to people maybe yeah I wondered about that too but other than that everything seems pretty normal so far so in 1955 Melissa met her first husband Russell Shepard a factory worker with whom she eventually had two children and her first marriage ended in divorce and as we'll learn later Russell kind of dodged a bullet on this one yeah he looks back on that and just Whew. Yes. From the 70s through to the 90s, Melissa racked up more than 30 convictions under four different names. She had charges for fraud, impersonation, forgery, and littering. She served multiple prison sentences. It's a lot of like just tiny chart, even littering. It's like, how do they catch this? Right. Are you like a I'm habitual surprised. litterer? Right. 
They've got word that there's this person that litters in the neighborhood. We need to watch out for them. Also, I think because we live not only in the U.S., but in L.A., it's just littering is so common. Maybe it's just a Canadian thing. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, maybe (laughs) that is it. Because it's not like you can't get a ticket for littering here, but it's just so uncommon because everybody is awful to our planet in Los Angeles. People shit out windows on the 405. Constantly. It's crazy. There's got to be signs in L.A. I don't know. There's got to be everywhere else, too. But especially in L.A. about throwing your cigarettes out the window. Yes. Because of the wildfires. Yeah. So, yeah, it's bad enough to where they have to put signs up. So, I don't know. I'm assuming it's just a little different in Canada. Maybe because their crime is so much less that they have time to focus on those things. That's probably it. I'm going to go with that. Littering task force. Right. So at 55 years old, she moved from petty charges to violent crime. It's pretty late in life. And if you remember from our first episode, it's after 40 where the statistics kind of drop to almost zero, right? Yeah, it's kind of out of nowhere. Yeah. I, I don't know. A criminal record that's this petty and then all of a sudden to jump, it's, it's very, very out of the ordinary. So in 1988, while still technically married to Russell, Melissa was living on Prince Edward Island and looking to meet a new man. So she went on this blind date with someone named Gordon Stewart, and it was set up through this Lonely Hearts Club column. That's how old school this is. She was looking in the back of, you know, the penny saver. Yes. Looking for dates. Once upon a time, Backpage wasn't a skeezy thing. It was actually where singles met. Yeah, you you could like Like, get a washer dryer and meet someone. Really, truly. So Gordon was a retired army veteran whose wife had actually recently passed away. And he was really trying to just put himself back together and move on and get himself out there and meet a woman, you know. But it was a slow process for him. So he turned to the Lonely Hearts Club these little ads. So after their blind date, they decided to continue seeing each other. And it seems that one of the attractions for Melissa was that Gordon had a $50,000 pension. Yeah, that definitely is intriguing and enticing to her. Yeah, Melissa doesn't really go anywhere unless there's money involved. Yeah, there has to be a substantial amount. After about a year of dating, they married in 1990. And they had two ceremonies, one in Vancouver and one in Las Vegas. After the wedding, Gordon started developing an addiction to drugs and alcohol. And their marriage was pretty tumultuous. They fought a lot, and he even got charged with assaulting Melissa. It's interesting, just after they get married, now he suddenly is a drunk. (laughs) Right. I mean, it's probably been there all along, but she amped that shit up or something. Somebody did. I don't want to blame her, but you know. Yeah, I definitely never want to blame someone else's actions on a person. It's all about personal responsibility. He could have dealt with it differently or just left. But I think everybody has this hesitance to leave relationships. And some people just cope with it in different ways. See what works. Really definitely not her fault at all. But it is telling of her kind of patterns and the way that she handles relationships. So I would never say drinking is her fault. However, when you see that there's a pattern in a person that nobody can be in a relationship with her, there's definitely something she's doing that's wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. Around Christmas of 1990, Stuart went to the hospital because he was extremely disoriented and foaming at the mouth. Tests showed that he had a large amount of benzodiazepines in his system, which, of course, seems extremely suspicious. That's a lot. He's just foaming at the mouth when they bring him in. I mean, that's a lot of just stuff in him going on. And this poor guy. Mm-hmm. He, I mean, and, you know, he's probably drunk on top of it. <laughs> right? It's crazy to me that he was foaming. I don't yeah. know what it has to take to get you to foam at the mouth. The first thing I thought was how much drugs and alcohol did he have in his system? I've seen people on Seroquel like have drool just coming down their face and they didn't even know. Really? That drug is crazy as fuck. Yeah. <gasps> it makes people disgusting. Like their mouths. It affects something with like like spit. Huh. Yeah, it's weird. I've never That's heard a heavy that duty one though. 
But yeah, this has got to be is just like something Xanax. heavy duty too. I mean, this is just yeah. Wow, it's overwhelming to me the visual of of what the doctors would have seen that day. So this was not the first time that Gordon had been observed under the influence of some sort of unknown substance. And it was speculated that he was at the beginning stages of dementia on top of all the substance abuse. In 1991, Gordon and Melissa got into another physical altercation and the cops were called. Gordon pled guilty to assaulting Melissa and he did a small stint in jail. Whatever it was that they fought about at this time seemed to blow over because she actually visited him while he was in jail. He might not have any recollection of what happened. And so it's like, oh, you did this. I'm just going to come. I'm your wife. I'll come visit you. Yeah. Seems totally normal in the sense. It's like, oh, he's just he was drunk. He does drugs. He, he didn't remember. It seems highly likely that that would be the case. He didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. But anytime I hear that a woman visited a guy in jail after he beat her up, I'm just like, nope. It's a hard pass for me. No sympathy anymore. There's an entire show called Love After Lockup. <laughs> it's on season two, and this exists. I mean, I really, it just confuses me because he, I don't know. Everything she does confuses me. But you would think that if he hurt you and he's in jail, most people are trying to get restraining orders. Most people are really trying to get away from their abuser. For someone to be in a safe position where they're away from you and they can no longer harm you, and now you're seeking them out, it just really doesn't sit right with me. It makes me very angry because there's so many women that are not protected the way that we need to protect them, and they wish that they could have this peace of mind to know that someone is locked away. This is a long con, though. Yes. So this yes. is just kind of a piece of the puzzle. In any normal situation. But I yes. guess this is not the normal situation. I should I should uh, this is true. have that caveat for sure. So eventually she kept visiting him. They kind of rebuilt their relationship and he was released. But he had the conditions of parole that he was supposed to not have contact with Melissa. And they just couldn't do it. You know, they just kept in touch and Melissa was not ready to end the relationship. So she sought him out after the release, even though it was part of his parole for them not to see each other. She made it really clear that she wanted to give their relationship another chance and they reconciled. On April 27th, 1991, they went out for a moonlit drive on a nearby deserted dirt logging road near Halifax. Melissa says, according to her, that Gordon grabbed her from the car, held a knife to her, and raped her right there. Melissa says that after the rape, Gordon went around to the back of the car to pee. So Melissa scooted over to the driver's seat, put the car in reverse, and drove over Gordon. She then put the car back into drive and ran over him again with this big old Chevy Cavalier is what they were driving. So several hours later, she reported the death herself. I bet this is where she stands there and goes, look at all these police reports. Yes. Of him assaulting me and doing this. And like, she's thinking. Yeah. When this was back. a long con. Now that I like. Yeah, this was a long con. When I think back about it and all the domestic stuff. I really hate questioning any sort of domestic abuse. I really, it just is like nails on a chalkboard emotionally. I do too, but there's also record in medical files that like this man, something suspicious, he's probably being poisoned. Yes. Like he's being drugged. So it seems more likely that the domestic violence was on her end towards him. Or and then reactionary when, or, you some, know, they fight. Like this is what they do. Yeah. But for her... To be able to be like, this is why I was so afraid. And he raped me, which is kind of weird because there's no history of like sexual violence necessarily. And then it comes out of nowhere. And then they just pull over on a dirt road and he raped, and they're married. It's like, you can just go home. <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's like, it's just kind of the whole thing is trying to make him as erratic and crazy as possible. Yes. So she could run him down. No, I think that when you look back at it, 
it had to be the sort of thing that she orchestrated so that years later she could say that she was the victim Yeah, when he was gone. So when she made the report and they started looking into what happened, all the appropriate medical testing was performed on Melissa, but it didn't substantiate her claim of rape or assault. Gordon was tested later, and it was found that he had a lethal dose of benzodiazepines, specifically Valium and Restoril, in his system. And he was thoroughly drugged when she ran him over. So because of the drugs in his system, there's a lot of questions if, you know, whether or not Gordon was dead or alive at the time that he was run over. And if he maybe possibly overdosed and then she put him on the ground and ran him over. Commonsensical thing here. Devil's advocate a little bit. When you are that fucked up on benzos, there's no way you're getting your dick hard. Honestly, that was my next thought was just like, not only was he possibly not alive, but if he was alive, it wouldn't even physically be possible. No, he would have been passing out, nodding out. The whole thing that I just, it's like physically, if he has that much in his system, there's no way he's even like, having a conversation enough to be like, I'm doing this to you now, pull over, you know, or whatever. I just, there's no way. There, Yeah, it's not possible. And you physically cannot do anything with your dick if you're that fucked up on benzos. Yes. The kind of overpowering that he would need to do physically, the kind of like sexual function that would need to be happening, not at all possible if you're just knotted out on benzos. So... There's a lot of questions here, and especially once the sexual assault wasn't substantiated by testing, we've got some big problems. That's like one of the bigger, to me, that's that whole kind of you put it and look at a big picture. It's pretty clear. To yes. Me. I don't know. Call me crazy. <laughs> crazy. Okay. <laughs> so after a pretty simple trial on May 26, 1992, she was convicted of manslaughter and received a six-year prison sentence for his death. While at Prison for Women in Kingston, Ontario, she was focused mostly on attempting to form support groups, like Project Another Chance, which offers counseling to women prisoners. So she was really seemingly trying to put her experience to better use. And she painted herself in a picture of being a hero at this point. So with good behavior, Melissa only served two years before getting early release. It's not bad. Two years. Sounds like she enjoyed her time. Did you hear me? I said she murdered someone and spent two years in jail. Yeah, (laughs) I did hear that. I'm freaking out. It's appalling. But I mean, (laughs) she got out on good behavior. This is just crazy to me. I can't believe that she murdered someone and was just barely in jail. But she behaved and well. went home. So, That's you know, so let nuts. her go. After she got out in 1994, she went on speaking tours across the country and she spoke to large audiences about her experience with battered women's syndrome and especially committing murder in self-defense. That's just not... I, it just like speaks to some shitty character to me because yeah you know you probably were a victim of domestic violence assault like abuse I don't doubt that I really don't however you're drugging this guy back in a car over him and he I mean he's not a threat anymore he's just like peeing over here and you're killing him so it's like it's kind of crazy to me because you're a murderer and I don't believe it was self-defense so It's almost like questioning, making me question my intelligence, and that really bothers me. So I did look into this kind of situation for a case that I did on season one. Awesome. And I know that studies show victims usually wait till someone is in a vulnerable position. So oftentimes you see cases of self-defense, in quotes, that people are questioning because the person at the time was sleeping or the person at the time of the attack was peeing behind the car or something. You're right. This is super common. You're right. Because during the attack, you are defenseless, but afterwards, that's the time that you feel safe to actually 
stop the violence. Yeah. This is really extremely common. But this wasn't the case with Melissa. No. That's the thing, is the whole time she was perpetrating violence on him through the drugging and whatever sort of physical altercations that they were having that seemed to be very mutual. It seemed like, from what people were saying, he wasn't instigating them. Most of the times, it seems like it was self-defense. And when she would claim that there's violence, he was way too nodded off to even do anything. That's what I keep thinking. He's too drunk and like benzoed out to even really do anything. Yeah. So I, it does make sense for any other case. Yes. Any other case that you look at, it's like, okay, this person was in a vulnerable position and that's when the victim of domestic violence chose to actually get their yeah, you're right. revenge. I, revenge isn't the right word, but actually, you know, protect themselves. Yeah. So I get that. However, Melissa's not that person. She really, I don't think, was in the position of, you know, a victim at this point. I think that she was constantly fighting with him. Yeah, I agree. And because especially that he developed some sort of apparent substance abuse problem after their marriage, I don't necessarily know if it was all alcohol. In my mind, that tells me He's not necessarily drinking. He's being drugged. Yeah, I agree. That's what makes sense. So people are saying, oh, he's got this problem, blah, blah, blah. He never had a problem before. It was just all of a sudden, as we'll find out with her, she's just putting drugs in people's drinks. So he's drinking coffee. He's not drinking beer, alcohol, anything. Yeah, I don't know. If it was anyone else, it would stand up. But for her, she had been drugging him the whole time. She's so sneaky. Yeah. Ugh. So with her speaking tours, Melissa mostly talked about wanting to help other women escape their own abusive relationships. And because of all her work she did, she received a government grant to help her with developing a program to help women. In 1994, she was featured as one of the main subjects of a documentary called When Women Kill. And in that documentary, of course, she spins the web of being the victim of abuse and never acknowledges any of the drugging or anything like that. Yeah, no, it's just all his fault. Yeah. He has been abusive all the time from the beginning, from the get, I reacted. There was one journalist named Barbara McKenna who actually wrote an article calling Melissa out and questioning her hero status by going through her past and detailing all her previous crimes. I like Barbara. Yeah, it's just this one woman that was like, okay, yes, the work she's doing is good. We need women standing up for other women. But maybe this isn't the right person to profile. Yeah, there's more to this. Yeah, this isn't the hero that you're making her out to be. This is actually a person that's got quite a questionable history. So other than that one person, I mean, everybody was really buying her act, it seemed like. So once Barbara came out, Melissa threatened to sue her, and this put an end to that journalist making accusations, and the lawsuit didn't go anywhere, but Barbara McKenna was silenced at that point. In 2000, Melissa met 82-year-old engineer named Robert Frederick at a Christian retreat in Florida and told him that God wants us to be married. So smooth. She's going international and upping her game. Yeah. And she's using his beliefs against him. It's that's like whole other levels of craziness to me. It's totally next level. And from what I heard, she really put on this huge act of this just devoted Christian woman from all accounts. She was even speaking in tongues, talking about God all the time. Making it, yes, I swear. <laughs> and it, it really made it seem like this was their mission, that the two of them were supposed to be together because God wanted it. It was crazy. So because apparently God wanted them to be married, they got engaged after knowing each other only a few days. And then since the engagement moved quickly, they were only engaged for a month and they got married in Nova Scotia. It's so 
interesting that a lot of other people probably wouldn't have just been like, let's do this. But because she brings up the God gave me this vision and if he's at a Christian retreat, he's probably open to that. Yeah. And he probably does believe it. Like this is a a sign from God. This is what I'm supposed to do. She told me. (laughs) And I'm 82 years old. I don't want to be alone. I think that's just like exploitation to another level. Again, she's gross. Yeah. And he's in his 80s. She's in her 50s, late 50s, early 60s at this point, right? So got this hot young thing. That's what I'm just going to say. This hot young thing. Plus, God wants you to do it. Oh, yeah. So that's what we're doing. Plus, maybe she speaks tongues in the bedroom. You never know. Dude, she's only like (laughs) 53, right? Maybe she has Pilates. She's full of all sorts of tricks. She was way better than like 80-year-olds in the home. (laughs) It's definitely a better alternative. He doesn't have to like change her either. Oh God, right? court! <laughs> as you get, these are things we have to talk about as you age. This is real life. This is what happens. Do we have to talk? I don't. I don't. We don't have to. I don't want to think it. about it. But when you're 53, going for 82 that's not year a factor. Olds, like you know, yeah, I kind of think about that shit sometimes. But so anyway, apparently they went on a honeymoon that lasted five months and cost two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And who is not just like, hey, this is a little unreasonable, guys. That's crazy. That's completely insane. It sounds like fun, though. Oh, yeah. That right? sounds amazing. Like, oh, live in your life. But-, but I'm trying to plan a honeymoon. And I'm like, OK, two weeks. Is that too much? Like, my girl might not want to be gone that long from work. And I'm like, but it's a honeymoon. You're like, now I look at this on? and I'm like, yeah, I need to show her about Melissa Ann Shepard and be like, look, we got to leave for a couple weeks. Could be way worse for you. I could be asking for five months. Oh, I could be asking for so much more. <laughs> so very soon after his family noticed that he was having fainting spells, slurred speech and was in and out of hospitals for generally failing health. I feel like, you know, this could happen. He's 82, starts happening, can be overlooked for a while. And that's the thing is she is totally banking on the fact that this is a normal transition within the age demographic that she's dating. She's really, really counting on the fact that all the family members and loved ones are going to be like, oh, well, you know, this happens. He's in his 80s. Because in any other case, that would be true. Yeah, it's usually as a particularly harsh winter and the slow decline. There's always some sort of event that's, you know, loss of a loved one. Like you said, the weather, some sort of difficulty physically, you know, makes them take a turn. He's 82. But with her, we know that it's always Melissa. She's the reason for the turn. So this change was particularly concerning for the family members because they actually figured Robert was mostly in good health before and it was suspicious to his loved ones that he took this turn. Most other family members just kind of chalked it up to something normal, but his family said, no way, this isn't him. It wouldn't happen this fast. So it was either that the change was so severe or that it happened so quickly, but no matter what, they were like, we need to intervene, which was awesome. It was also noticeable, and I think this helped them figure it out, was that when he went to visit his children in Boston, away from Melissa, he was completely fine. Yeah, that's, I mean, if you are already suspicious, you know, yeah, come visit me for a week, leave her there. And he just is fine, he's going for walks, he's doing everything normal again like he was, he's not slurring, he's not... Yes, this is immediate. It's like Casey Kasem Mm -hmm. and that whole thing when they're just like, well, when he's away, he's fine. He says totally normal shit. She gets around. He is just crazy, robotic. Nothing's normal. And family would definitely catch up on that. Yeah. So they were suspicious right away, which is really, really great. It's so often we see these stories and we're like, what are you? What's wrong with you? You know, but this family was on top of it from the get go. And then once they had their suspicions, after seeing him not around her being okay, it was confirmed. They knew what was going on. So after one too many trips to the ER, Robert's son, Bob, called an elder abuse hotline. And he told them that Melissa was the reason for their father's rapid decline. 
So the family sought the help of an elder care agency to help bring him some long-term nursing or whatnot. And the agency recommended 24-hour care for Robert. But Melissa refused. I mean, this is a professional group. This is what they do. They assess. And they say he needs 24-hour care. He's at that point now. No, I don't think he does. I mean, that's another just, what the fuck are you doing? It's another huge red flag when the person that loves him, that married him recently, doesn't want to get him help that professionals are recommending. She's not even concerned with it. Right. It's the children that have to call. So it's not enough of a concern for her. And then when the actual agency makes a recommendation, she doesn't go along with it. If you love someone, you want the absolute best for them. You don't want them to be uncomfortable, in pain, struggling, whatever that may be. So you're like, yes, let's get help. Let's get people in here. And good on those kids for calling. Yes. A lot of them will just, you know, don't want to make waves. It's great that they called because then, you know, there's a record. Finally, elder abuse. Absolutely. We need to get these things reported and on paper. We need to have some sort of trail and sort some sort of agency to come in and help on top of that. So not only do we have a record of it, but we have people actively trying to help, you know. But as Melissa does, she threatened to sue the agency. So anytime someone goes against her, it seems like she just lashes out, attacks, threatens a lawsuit, and tries to get things to go away. And it worked. They backed off. The agency kind of just took a back seat and... Of course, once they were out of her hair, she didn't get any additional care for Robert. She's a threatening, litigious bully. Yes. It's so ridiculous. That's a great way to put it. She's and a I, litigious bully. I, I wonder, think that's a lot of people. Yeah, you know? and I wonder if she is, I can see her being like wild and out enough that she's the one writing like the paperwork from the attorney in quotes to them. I'm going to sue your ass. Oh, wait, that's not what they would say. Professional, right? Or if maybe she like knows somebody and it's really an attorney and they're writing all this shit for her. I mean, it's just really interesting because this is not, there's multiple times in this that threaten a lawsuit, threaten a lawsuit. Well, you have to, like, if you're really going to threaten a lawsuit, you bring a piece of paper and go, hey, I'm going to sue your ass. Yeah, most people won't back off when someone just mentions it verbally. And so she exactly. would, like you said, have to have a friend that's helping her out or maybe just some fake letterhead. To make it seem official. Fake letterhead all day. She's not above apparently getting prescriptions that aren't for her. I mean, why would she care about fake letterhead? You know? And at this point, she is, let's see, sorry. She is Melissa Ann Russell Shepard Stewart Friedrich right now. <laughs> so, I mean, she's got a option. She's got driver's licenses for every single one of those names too. And you know that they're still valid for however many years, probably just writing shit up, racking stuff up. Now I'm really going to the fraud con part of this. Yes. But it, it applies because her whole thing, this whole thing, a whole bubble is con. Long con. It's all about the money. Yeah. She's definitely weaved a web of lies. She's familiar with forging documents. She's familiar with impersonation and fraud. So it doesn't really matter to her to say, oh yeah, I'm going to sue you. And come up with some fake information to make that seem credible. And every time she does it, people back down. Yes. Nobody if checks this bitch. Right. If it's working small, for right? her, then why not keep doing it? Oh. So after the sort of uh, elder care agency kind of backed off a little bit, Melissa turned her attention to Robert's children. And in an ill-advised decision, Melissa called and left the following voicemail. For her new stepson. Can I take a stab at it? Yep. Okay. Hi, Bob. This is Melissa Frederick. I have something to share with you this morning. Your father and I are going to see a lawyer. We've made an appointment and your father is going to change his will. He's going to leave all the money to me and the portion that was set aside for you and your brothers is going to go to the Christian retreat. And you guys are getting a big fat zero. So try that on for size and have a nice day. It's so weirdly polite, 
I'm so angry. The whole time, that's what I think too, is just like, please have a shitty day. I hope it's great. <laughs> and when you hear the actual voicemail, yeah. that's exactly how she sounded. She was calm. She wasn't yelling. She was just a little bit, you could feel the tension in her voice, but she wasn't angry. She was just very politely saying, hey, go fuck yourself. You're not getting anything. To Melissa, because she is not in a love relationship. This is a business relationship. So therefore, all she's doing is calling another company on the phone and saying, hey, your bid, it was bullshit. And I want you to know I'm going with another company because they're 10 grand less than you. Have a nice day, though. It's like that jab at the end. But this is all just business. This is just yeah. money related. So it's cold as ice. You don't give a shit. These aren't her kids. And they're calling elder abuse on her trying to fuck this thing up for her. And she wants them to know. That's the other thing. She's vindictive. Yeah. If she wasn't, she might have skated on a little easier time. She hadn't left voicemails like that. Because no. there's another one, too, that she leaves that's equally as just stupid as fuck. She <laughs> irritates me. I'm sorry. It's just like, I don't, she just bugs. Yeah. Anybody to me that, one of my biggest problems, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go on a huge tangent. Tell me. But it really bothers me. That anytime a woman says something happened to her, oftentimes people have a huge response of not believing this yes, woman. Yes, that's true. And one of the things that they bring up is that women lie, that they lie about whatever it is, whether it be a baby, a sexual assault, or whatever. People will say she's making it up. The reason that that happens is because 1% of people lie. It's such a small percentage. And because of that, we pay for it by having 90% of people not be believed. Even when there's like pictures, evidence, 20 other women saying the same thing about one person. But it's because of women like fucking Melissa that this happens. And that's what is just infuriating. Like I can feel my limbs like shaking right now. It makes me so fucking angry. Because anytime someone lies about domestic violence or, you know, um, rape or molestation, like these are things that paint women in a bad light and make it more likely for women to not be believed. And it drives me absolutely crazy and makes me so upset. This tangent, I have one thing to add, and it's related to, I know, I'm sorry, guys, Celebrity Big Brother UK. <laughs> okay, listen, Roxanne Pallet was on there. And I can't remember the guy's last name, Ryan, one who ended up winning. He was like walking by and just kind of like, did he punch? It's just like, did it like a th like a play. She goes off and tells everyone and goes around and starts crying in the confessional. He punched me in the face. He hit me. He did this. He assaulted me. All the boys in the house are just like, fuck this guy. Like everyone's going to attack this and this and this and this. The footage is there. He just like walks past her and basically like, oh, no, like a jack, you know, just play it. Like, like it a little so bro brother, sister, kind brother, of thing. sister. Huh. So I didn't, I didn't watch it again and again to see like, what the hell? He was, his whole entire life was just crumbling and you saw it. And then people's reaction on the outside, dude, she'll never like, she's never going to live that down because people saw it with their own eyes that this woman is accusing him of that. And she's just lying and she is a great example, too, of this. And it's, it's on a lesser scale, but so I know we have a lot of UK listeners, and I'm just like, you saw it. You saw it yourself. <laughs> and I don't know who's going to hire her after this. She had to go on a Mia Culpa tour on everything. I'm so sorry. I lied, but good luck, bitch. That was fucked up. And it's kind of the same thing. It's just. But it's just such a small percentage of people. And those kind of people, I mean, that's the thing about Melissa is it's so extreme, that for so long she was lying. And I don't necessarily, I don't know anything about the Big Brother incident. But to me, it's people that have a pattern of lying. Yes. So it's one person creating 30 stories within 100 people's individual lives because people are recalling back on their own lives, their own experiences. So they're like, oh, but I know this one bitch that lied. So now everybody's capable of it. Well, it's not. It's one person that's got a history of criminal behavior. You know, I don't know what what the girl on Big Brother has a history of, you know, Lying. but oftentimes this is a pattern. It's not an isolated thing. But because their experience has touched so many people, 
then when someone else comes forward, those people that saw it firsthand are like, yeah, I don't believe anyone anymore. That's exactly where it went. People are like, I saw it. I was like, what the fuck? And then, yeah, it just kind of makes you question. And then when you see things like that, you see exactly like this is how this shit happens. It's It's just just this one woman, you know, (sighs) we're trying so hard. We're, We're trying to be heard. Yes. Finally. So when someone ruins it for the rest of us. And we're making, we're gaining momentum. We're, we're like, hey, this is happening. And then Roxanne goes on Big Brother and it's just like knocking us back some steps here. Like, damn it. Now I've got to be like explaining again why you should believe me. Because you should believe me. Right. It has nothing to do with me. However, now I have to stick up for everyone because you ruined it. And that's really what Melissa's entire story is about yes is over and over again making false claims doing things that are fraudulent and impersonation so that now people can't trust what they're seeing in front of them and because she was such a bully like if you questioned it what you think i'm lying right and yeah. that makes it even worse because then it's like oh fuck yes you are lying <laughs> we all know that you're lying yeah Yeah, that was a rough tangent, but it's good. But it's like you have to talk about this shit because it's just getting like out of control. So even though Melissa did tell a lot of lies and we know this is a pattern for her, this one actually wasn't. This one was the truth. And he changed his will. Robert took his sons out of the will and made Melissa the sole beneficiary of his estate ill-advised decision (laughs) around this time it is alleged that some of robert's money was also disappearing and of course it's assumed that melissa was taking it but at this point it didn't really matter anymore that the money was disappearing because in december 2002 robert died of cardiac arrest there was no autopsy he was quickly cremated And no one was charged. I mean, that worked out well, too, for her. And that's one of the things that bothered the family the most because they had no answers. Because she was in charge of it, it worked out well, but also she orchestrated all of it. She had all the power so she could get him cremated right away. And no suspicion was put on her. Nobody could say, hey, look, he's foaming at the mouth. He's got all these drugs in his system. Let's talk about this. So after his death... She stayed in Florida for five months. She sold his house and she collected $100,000 of life insurance. Melissa continued to collect and cash his social security checks for two years after his death. That just seems really weird to me that especially when her her, uh, his kids are so suspicious of her and all this, like you'd want to close accounts. You'd want to make sure like social security knows he's dead. All of that stuff. Yes. So you would think that they would have been more on top of it. One of the things that I heard though, was that she had with her multiple IDs that we talked about collected checks from two different identities or something like they couldn't trace it because of they couldn't really trace her because of all the different names she was using. I don't exactly know how it works, but that was one of the factors from what I understand. She really knows like wire fraud, mail fraud really well. She knows like all the rules and about all that stuff, check cashing and all that stuff. She's yes. good at that. It's one of those things like we've talked about before. When someone wants to be good at something, they learn everything. Yes. You don't have to be smart in any other area except for you know how to take advantage of people and take advantage of the system. So she taught herself well. It just, it does really stand out to me. And I guess maybe it's just there's too much work for too few people. But wouldn't someone sending out the checks try and look into the fact that the wife has so many charges? You know, you would think that there would be some sort of background checks. Where's the fraud department? An auditor, maybe? Something. Someone to step in. Review a book or two. And then on top of that, then there's his family that could have said something. But I don't know. They waited and maybe they didn't know. That's the other thing. They wouldn't have to be notified that she hasn't reported his death, you know, especially if she's the sole executor of his estate or whatever it may be. 
it's possible they didn't step in because they didn't know. Yeah. That's what makes sense to me. So what they could do, though, is sue her because they accused her of murdering him by overdosing him on prescription medications. So if they didn't know about the sort of fraud that was happening, they kind of did what was in their power. However, she was never charged for the murder. But the sons were able to win back $15,000 of their father's money. And that was all that they could even prove, you know? Right. Just 15 grand. And it was just hundreds of thousands. But it was more about the principle of we see you. Yeah, not letting her get away with it. Yeah. I feel like we see you should be one of Courtney's taglines. Yeah. You I say that see so you. much. You're like, we see you. No, it's true. <laughs> it's, it's like, why do people lie about things? You can Google. I say that all the time, too. It's like, we see you. Yeah. They think that no one sees what they're doing. And that's Melissa. She's yeah. like, nobody sees what I'm doing. It's fine. So, of course, it's worked for her a few times by this point. So she tries it again. And in 2005... She joins AmericanSinglesDating.com, where she met Alex Stratagos in Pineus Park, Florida. Some of that's got to be pronounced wrong, but it's I'm cool. It's on. Pinellas Park, but that's yeah, it. you know, double L's. Well, isn't I a believe y sound? it would really be like Pineus, sure, but I mean, this is Florida. It's Pinellas. Really, I'm yeah. too Mexican for that shit. No, see, I agree with you because <laughs> we live in Southern California, so I'm like, oh, it's Pineus, fuck, you know what I mean? But like, it's Pinellas. In Florida. That's funny. I didn't think that at all. Yeah. Huh. I wonder if someone in Florida would be like, where are you talking about? Right. You would <laughs> said that. That would be funny. After corresponding online, she drove to Florida in her new white Cadillac to meet him. Riding in style. <laughs> On the night of their very first date, she spent the night at his house. And she never left essentially moving into his apartment after the first date. And he also went to the ER with a head injury. That was a wild night. <laughs> there was oh, a lot that happened. A lot I going on. I told you she had tricks in the bedroom. Oh, See? <laughs> that's got to be it. Head injury. So shortly after she moved in, he begins having dizzy spells, fainting, and is hospitalized eight times. Eight I feel like times. we've seen this before. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is a, is a pattern. pattern. <laughs> Jinx, you owe me a coat. <laughs> Alex gave Melissa power of attorney while in the hospital, and she drained him of $18,000. I mean, even though it's his wife, right? Are they, they married, mm -hmm. correct? Even oh, though, no, they're not oh, married they're just, yet. Okay, so, even, oh my God, even worse. Like, you give it to your kids. You know, like, you don't just give some random that moved in with you on a date. Yeah, you've known Your each other how long? Yeah. You trust a coworker more than that. Alex's son called the police to let them know that he had seen very strange activity in his father's bank account and that he'd been hospitalized a bunch of times recently. His son says that before bed each night, Melissa would give him a bowl of ice cream. And Alex's son says that he would start falling and being out of it right after eating the ice cream. Tests were run and Alex tested positive for multiple tranquilizers, none of which were prescribed to him. But none of this could be proved that it was poisonous, you know? Now, if he has no history of ever like pill shopping, doctor shopping, taking other people's meds, that's a red flag. That just all of a sudden now he's taking prescription pills that aren't his. So where is he getting them? And is he taking them or are they being fed to him? Right. I mean. It's just hard to prove all of these things. Oh, of course. And that's what Melissa knows with her crimes is it's difficult to prove that something is criminal. You know? Bitch. So the only thing that they could do was charge Melissa with three counts of grand theft from a person 65 or older two counts of forgery, and two counts of using a forged document. She pled guilty to all seven charges and was sentenced to five years in prison. Which, might I point out, was longer than she served for actually murdering someone early on in her career. Yeah, I was just going back. I'm like, wait, what year is this? I'm like, 2009, she's getting back in Canada already. 
Yeah. Like, I mean, it's it's crazy that the things that she's held accountable for and the things she isn't. Yes. It's just priorities. Very crazy. So in 2009, she was released and deported back to Canada. She moved into a retirement community in Nova Scotia, and she started using the name Millie Russell. And she seemed to be living a normal life. And of course, it's important to point out, here's yet another alias and another name. And it's not too far off because Melissa and Millie, it's just a nickname. And Russell is one of her many last names. She's got plenty of them to choose from. But she was already known in Canada for being a criminal in so many other instances. So now she's able to just change her name and move on. She's been in a documentary. There's news articles written about her. But she can escape all of that because now she's Millie Russell. Start over. Yeah. But she couldn't stay single for long. And by 2012, 77-year-old Melissa was prowling for a new husband. And she was hoping that she could find a rich one this time. Melissa had heard that her 75-year-old neighbor, Fred Weeks, was a recent widower. And he was kind of struggling with loneliness. So she showed up and started knocking on his door. And she basically flat out told him that she was lonely too. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> like just knock, knock. Hey, hey, Fred, I live across the street and I heard you were lonely. And I'm kind of lonely too. You want to plant some pansies in the front yard together? Yeah, I heard that they just met a couple times and then she was like kind of showing up and wanting to help him out around the house. Like, oh, I'm lonely. Let me, you know, help you with this and help you with that. And it was just like, well, I don't want us both to be lonely. So I'll help you with something, you know? Almost like a roommate. Kind of. Tinge. Yeah. Like, well, I've got to go grocery shopping. So what do you need from the store? Yeah. That kind of stuff. So after a brief courtship, they got engaged. Fred would later say that he thinks that he was drugged through basically their entire relationship. So that's why he agreed to the wedding so quickly. Otherwise, if he was in his right mind, he really wouldn't have moved that fast. Since they were in a rush to get married, Fred's friend George, who was a justice of the peace, offered to marry them. The day that Fred picked up their marriage certificate, he actually got in a car accident and wrecked his car. He said that at the time he felt really disoriented and his brain wasn't communicating properly with his limbs. If only he hadn't made it eventually or to the office, right? Right. He was clearly in an accident on the way back. Yeah. It really would have saved him if it happened on the way there. Not to be morbid, but I mean, Jesus. He lived through the car accident. So like, yeah, let's say wish you had had it on the way there. Jeez. But before their wedding... The justice of the peace friend, George, tried to intercept and let Fred know that he had a weird feeling about Melissa. George had actually seen the coverage of Melissa's crimes, but because she was going by a different name, he kind of didn't realize who she was until after the wedding. He just knew he recognized her, there was something wrong, but he couldn't place it. Like, we've all had that feeling. Like, I, I know you from somewhere, but... He knew it was something negative. He just didn't know that it was as bad as it was. On September 25th, 2012, there was a civil union done in the living room uniting the groom and bride. This is something I talked about on our Patreon episode, having a wedding in a, a retirement community. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And it happens so often. It really does. It they really does. Find love and like, let's get married. Why not? And then they can share a room. Yeah, on Patreon, I talked about the story of my great uncle getting married in a retirement home. And I can picture this in my mind because I've seen it with my own eyes. Great story. Two elderly people just falling in love and getting married in their retirement community, in the living room. Now, also, the fact that there's been a documentary made. She's in this, she's a heavy co star in this documentary. And she's so. I don't know if it's like, I, everyone throws around narcissist, like buzzword. I, I don't know what it is, if it's like ballsy. But the fact that she's got a documentary out there mm -hmm. about this exact, I mean, so similar, right? And 
you're still doing this. You're still doing this. And I just think the interesting odds that he saw that doc and had put it together, but didn't put it together. And then can you imagine being like, oh yeah, she's from that movie, Women Who Kill. Oh my God, she's from that movie, Women Who Kill. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you got to tell your friend about this. And then you're just like, oh God, I sealed his death warrant. Right. You're the person that married them. Right. So you feel like it's on you. And from what I understand, he tried to call the police, but there was nothing the police could do. She hadn't really done anything illegal by this time. Once he realized it, he tried to report it. It's just he's kind of everyone's kind of stuck in this situation. She served her time. She's out on the streets, so there's nothing they could do if she hasn't done anything wrong. They just have to wait for her to mess up again. Exactly like restraining orders, too. Yes. You just have to wait for someone to violate, and it's so fucked up. But you know you know, with this situation that it's going to happen, you know? So they were supposed to honeymoon in the U.S., but she conveniently lost her passport. And of course, we know that felons can't leave the country, right? So... She definitely, quote unquote, lost it. She hid it somewhere or just made up some excuse. They decided to honeymoon in Newfoundland. They could have honeymooned at Peace Arch Park in Canada. <laughs> right on the border. Right, where you're allowed where the to bikers yell at, go. Exactly. Yell at people across the border. Hey, what are you, doing? you can see it. Nobody's <laughs> crossing it. They could have gotten that close. They could have. Right? That would have been a lovely honeymoon, I'm sure. The first days of the honeymoon, Fred began not feeling well. And he would later say that he doesn't remember anything about the trip. Immediately when they arrived, he needed a wheelchair, which is shocking to me that he left fine. And then by the time he got to their destination, a mere hours later, he was wheelchair bound. They stayed at a B&B owned by Cheryl Chambers. And when they got to the B&B, Cheryl noticed that Fred looked quite sick. And Melissa just said that they had both been up all night with food poisoning. And Cheryl really thought this was pretty suspicious because Melissa actually looked fine. And it was him that looked so severely sick. He must have been like a body in a chair. Yeah. He was a shell of himself from yeah. everything that people report. I think they were probably really just like, you should be in a hospital, not in our B&B. We don't want to be responsible for this. And like just the actual concern for another human. Yes. Like, why aren't you with the doctors? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it was scary. And if she had the same thing that he had, then why is she fine and he's in a wheelchair? As the hours passed, Fred seemed to get worse. And by the next morning, Melissa said that he actually needed to go to the hospital. But when she was talking to Cheryl, she said she needed to basically finish her breakfast before they left. She said that she knew it was going to be a long day. So yeah. she wanted to be not depleted so she could be there for her husband. And thank goodness Cheryl didn't listen to her. She was like, well, that's a bullshit excuse. He needs <laughs> right? medical attention. Thank God, Cheryl. You know, so Cheryl just called the ambulance immediately, which saved his life, really. At the hospital, Melissa gave doctors incorrect information, like she said that he had no children, and she told them that he was prescribed sedatives. Fred tested positive for lorazepam and temazepam, which she had been putting in his coffee. Both prescriptions were found in her possession and were not prescribed to him. When he was tested, it was found that Fred actually had lethal amounts in his system. That's so much. He could have died. I mean, I think that when when they got the wheelchair and he arrived in a wheelchair, she was probably trying to kill him the first day, it seems like. Uh, yeah, he wasn't supposed to like make it through the night. No. Not at all. When they searched the hotel room where they were staying, they found a note that Melissa had written saying, Lawyer... Power of attorney, will. Just a to-do list. Scary. It was clear right away that his new wife was at fault. So, 78-year-old Melissa was charged with attempted murder of Fred. 
they found out later that there was a mistake on the marriage certificate, which nullified the union, meaning that they were never really married. Thank goodness. I wonder if that was purposeful or if it was really a mistake and she was like, damn it. I was I didn't even think about that. That's interesting. Well, for example, when R. Kelly and Aaliyah got married, he changed her age on the uh, marriage certificate from 15 to 18 because not a good look. Um, And so it always makes me wonder if there's anything like weird about stuff like that. What did we do here? Did we do this on purpose? Gypsy and her mom, Dee Dee Blanchard, she would lie about her age and change numbers and like put a little line on something so it could be a five or it could be a three. Yeah. So it just depends on what you want to say. So I wonder if this was a real mistake or if she really kind of fucked up. Or maybe just because she was using so many different names. Oh, good one. Then the name she was using may not have been her legal name. Yeah, you're right. You know? I like that. But I mean, no matter what it was, that was such a stroke of luck for him to go through this whole situation. If you're going to go through it, the best case scenario is that the marriage wasn't legal. Absolutely. The best situation. When police went through Fred and Melissa's home, they found a large stash of benzodiazepines, specifically 144 lorazepam tablets and temazepam. That's a lot. Yeah. They also found prescriptions from five different doctors, all with different names, along with a suspicious looking tub of ice cream that was taken for testing. So like we talked about the legal documents before, she was probably making up all sorts of stuff. Lawyers, doctors, whatever. It didn't matter to her. She was able to plead guilty to a lesser charge of administering a noxious substance. She served a three and a half year prison sentence. Attempted murder. Attempted murder reduced. Proven. Like just proven attempted someone. murder, you know? Yep. At her 2013 sentencing, Chief Justice Joseph Philip Kennedy said, quote, people who have contact with this lady should be careful. That's an understatement. (sighs) To this day, Fred Weeks is still plagued with tremors, and it's assumed that those tremors are permanent damage resulting from the medication overdoses. Fred says, quote, I think she's a wicked woman. She is not safe with any man. When Melissa was assessed before her parole hearing, it was reported that she was found to be at a high risk to reoffend. Yeah, I mean, she is a habitual offender. Yeah, Nothing's not only is it that. high risk, but we know that she reoffends. It's not like we need to speculate that she might. We know that that's something she does over and over, that jail time doesn't really help her learn her lesson. And she plans to reoffend. Yeah. And she'll figure out like an alias and then start it again. Absolutely. On March 18th, 2016, Melissa was released from prison again in Truro, Nova Scotia. She temporarily agreed to 22 conditions of her parole, but she said she plans to fight the long term restrictions litigious bitch yeah like she knows she can't get out without agreeing to them but that won't hold her down basically melissa is required to stay local in the halifax area and she cannot possess any drugs she doesn't have a prescription for she was also supposed to alert the police and make a report on any relationship she was in with any man So the police could let him know of her murderous past. It's an interesting caveat to this whole thing. I like that they wrote that in. I've never heard of that before. Uh, Me neither. But But it's, it's like having a registered sex offender. Yes. It makes perfect sense with her. It totally does. And my question really is, will they also notify the family? Probably not. But... But she seems like such a smooth talker that she could just be like, oh, so I got these charges. Like she could kind of talk it away. Like it was just a big misunderstanding, you know? So this is when- But the families are less likely to- This is when you hope and pray that there's somebody in that family checking up on their family, making sure they're okay. And you know that like a grandson is going to Google her name, right? I do that with everyone I know. Who are you dating? What's their last name? Okay, cool. I'll talk to you in like 20 minutes. I'll find out. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like hopefully there's a grandkid, a nephew, somebody 
Yeah. Googling names. Yeah. We talk about all that all the time, like check on your elderly family members, check on anyone that is in a situation where they may not be able to do that themselves. People fall through the cracks. All the time. All the time. So yeah, for her to just get out and them to have to notify whoever she's dating, I I almost don't think that's enough. The guy's family members need to know on top of just the person she's dating. Everyone should receive a copy of When Women Kill. (laughs) That should be in there too. Melissa was also required to keep police updated as to where she was living, as well as any changes to her appearance. Another thing I've never heard of, like if she dyes her hair, it's easy for her to just say she's a different person. Now she has to let the police know. This is the only way to keep her on a leash. Absolutely. When prior victim Alex Strategos heard about her release, he said, quote, I don't know what the judge had in his mind. What she was, she still is. She's the Black Widow. Guys better watch out. That's all I can say. In April 2016, within a month of her being released from prison, Melissa was seen using a computer in a Halifax library. She was using the internet and had a device capable of the internet access, both of which are breaking the terms of her release. (sighs) Huh? She is going to target someone else. We know she is. She's already got a list of probably like three or five people, and she's already doing the research. we It's just a matter of time before we see her again. Yeah. She was charged with violating parole, and a trial was set, but the charges were dropped in December 2016. Since her release, she was the subject of several investigation discovery shows. She was on Deadly Women, For the Money, Honey, and the show Web of Lies. Melissa is Canada's only known Black Widow type serial killer. There's part of me that questioned that, but I've heard it said multiple times. So I'm like, okay, we'll go with that. Yeah, everything you read, it says the same thing, that she's the only Black Widow in Canada. But I think that's just... She's the uh, only one that they know about. (laughs) That's my jaded US true crime brain that's telling me that because people are so brutal here. That I think I just have to assume that there's awful things happening, but I guess in Canada, they're not. I just honestly, the fact that she is seen in the library, just using it like nothing. And a month later, it's like she's not even trying to like lay low or be cool for a minute since I've just got out of prison. I mean, the the, again, the the balls, I, I can't just. Wow. And they can't do shit about it. Yeah. I don't know if it's because like they couldn't prove it or I mean, just that, you know, she gets these slaps on the wrist and now she's out and you in Halifax, I'm concerned for you. Just make sure to Google everyone you ever meet. I think her key demographic isn't listening to podcasts. You know what? That's why I tend to agree. That's why I was like maybe a grandkid or a great grandkid. Yeah. If you have a grandpa in the Halifax area. Just started dating like 79 year old Millie, Melissa, Margaret, Maggie. Something of that nature. Give it a Google. Check on check on your grandpa. You know what? Go online. Google Melissa and Shepard. Look at her picture. That's true. Start with that. And then get her dental records if that doesn't work. Unless she has dentures. (laughs) I'll figure this out for you. But my favorite thing, like when I was writing all this out, was what her name (laughs) ends up. It's it's Melissa Ann Russell Shepard Stewart Frederick Weeks. Yeah. That's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, I think that she is a master con woman. And I think that on top of that, She's just not afraid of getting caught. You know, whatever that is, like you said, the narcissist buzzword or just ego or just ball, whatever it is, chrome plated ovaries, she really doesn't care if she gets caught because she always gets these short sentences, these slaps on the wrist. She's caught violating parole, but then they drop the charges. Nothing sticks. She's Teflon. Never sticks. So, like, why would she think to stop? Because it's still working. And she is going to reoffend. 
The only time she'll stop is like when she dies, to be honest. No, you absolutely. Know? Like she'll probably still have something in the works when she's fading out. Yeah. It's just insane to me too the fact that this again, these people that we're talking about are like in their eighties and they're just on like dating apps and yeah. you know, meeting these people and going out and talking to her. And it's just she's at the library looking up people online. And it's just if that isn't a testament to, you know, I'm going with this, <laughs> like, like I have a plan and I'm sticking by it. And this is my MO. This is my pattern. This is what I do. On top of that, I see it as an MO, but also it's a career for her. Oh, has this been. is the only thing she's done her entire life. And on top of that, she's good at it. So it's not like she's like, well, I'm a waitress. Well, I'm a this or that or the other thing. No, she is a lifelong criminal. And that's it. So it's her career to be good at luring in men and finding them at websites on the library. Yeah. Yeah. And she's not even able to have a phone that has internet. So that's crazy to me. She just doesn't care. Flagrant violations of all her conditions. So we know she's definitely just out there dyeing her hair. Moving to a different city. She doesn't care. She does not care. That's like the best way to put that. Yeah. She just doesn't care. So it's just really nuts to me that she has done this so many times and still gotten away with it. And I wonder what it would be like if she was in America. You know, like, would we be more strict with her? It's possible because I think that the kids probably could have taken way more of a st- like a litigious stand against her yeah. and taken shit from her and made it a lot harder, like our sex offender registry kind of stuff. You know, like there's there might be things that they could have done differently that would have more of a record yeah. that, you know, would have been... Because there's a case also before that, you know, they said she settled. So maybe like stipulations in that could have changed. They might not have ever agreed to settle. They might have just been like, take this shit till a sentence. Yeah. Who knows? It, it, I mean, we can speculate all day, but... Regardless, I know, it just makes me think. Regardless, like, she's walking around Halifax. Yes. That's all. I just, I know it's just a hypothetical, but it's just kind of like, I wish that there was a way to just get her off the streets permanently. And you know, 84 like 84 this year, by the way. Yeah. 84 this year. 84, still. She was 82 when they saw her in the library. That was 20, uh, oh wait, <laughs> maybe 81, because that was 2016. So she's not going to stop. No. So hopefully we don't do a follow up and she just We're just, just dies. staring at each other. Sorry, we're just like <laughs> silently staring at each other like, whoa, she's not going to stop. No. So uh, look out, Halifax. I try not to wish death on people, but the streets would be safer. Everybody's grandpa would be safer if she was gone. So I hope she doesn't get the opportunity and she is just not able to reoffend because she's not going to just stop like something physically is going to have to stop her. And that's like we mentioned in the very first elderly episode. These type of offenders that are just going into their elderly years, they don't stop until they are physically unable to keep doing what they're doing. Yeah. So I hope that happens soon so that everyone's safe because that is scary. And that is our very last elderly case. It's been an interesting ride because... It was all poisoning. Always. Yeah, the methods are different. The victimology is different. And it's been interesting getting to really look into that. Yeah. And how those things change with age. But we are moving on to F next week. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's pretty much it. We just want to remind you that we have a new Patreon episode out. So if you're not on our Patreon, you can get access to those episodes by joining or get some merch on our thread list as well. And there's a lot of talk about Ted Bundy lately. And if you were at all interested in that, Courtney and I are on Crime Screen Podcast talking about the Ted Bundy tapes. So head over to Crime Screen Podcast if you want to listen to that because there's just a lot to unpack about Ted Bundy right now. So if you're interested, check it out. It's all anyone can talk about. Yeah. So with all that said, I think that we will just see you for letter F next week. So be nice to each other. Check on your grandpa. Always, Give him a call. Always just check on, you know, your family. Make friends, sure that they're okay. Neighbors. And 
be nice and then we'll see you next week. See ya. Bye. from dad <clears throat> all right save money on car insurance when you bundle home and auto with progressive can i take these off all right what is this this looks good wow that's well made where did you get this i'm talking to you with the hair yeah where did you get this it's good stuff that's solid that's not veneer that's solid stuff progressive can't save you from becoming your parents but we can save you money when you bundle home and auto progressive casualty insurance company affiliates and other insurers discounts not available in all states or situations and now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance.